Hello everyone, thank you ever so much for joining us today. As you might have seen in the news over the last couple of days, there's been a bit of a breakthrough in the Parkinson's research space. A biomarker has now been established for Parkinson's disease. Now to tell us a bit more about what biomarkers are and what impact this might have on the Parkinson's community, I'm joined by Jodie Forbes. Thank you ever so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. So maybe we should start with what a biomarker is. So the, one of the problems with Parkinson's has been having an objective test for whether you've got Parkinson's or not. So it's normally a clinical diagnosis. You go to see a neurologist and he checks or she checks whether you've got tremor, rigidity, slowness of movement and so on. And then you make a clinical diagnosis. And what would be really useful is something like a blood test or a urine test that says you've got Parkinson's or you haven't got Parkinson's. So that's exactly what a biomarker is. It's a definitive objective test based on a sample that you take from a person. Okay, okay. so in, in Prior to this, it's basically been a sort of symptomatic diagnosis process, has it? I guess uh, there are other conditions which might mimic symptoms of Parkinson's occasionally? Yes, I mean, there can be, there's some related conditions like multiple system atrophy and so on. A differential diagnosis between Parkinson's and these other things can be quite tricky. So there is a test today called a DAT scan, which is kind of a brain scan where they inject you with a radioisotope and it locks onto certain regions of the brain to look at the dopamine activity. That's very expensive and not easy to administer. And it's also not 100% reliable anyway. So, so this idea of a, a definitive biomarker is, is really a breakthrough. And the way that this particular one works is it uses what's called cerebrospinal fluid. So they take a small, small sample of fluid out of your spine and then they test it for the presence of a, a protein called alpha-synuclein. That's a hallmark of Parkinson's. And they've established that this is a very good indicator of whether you've got the disease or not. Uh, once you've got the results of this, this test, it's going to be a much more black and white yes or no, you, you do or don't have Parkinson's, I guess. Exactly. Well, nothing in medical science is 100%, unfortunately, but it's, it's way up in the 90% accuracy range. Um, so it's pretty reliable. And what's also interesting is it's what's called a prodromal marker as well. So prodromal means before you have a formal diagnosis, you have kind of early symptoms. So you might have constipation or you might have sleep disturbance. It's been shown that people with these symptoms, it can detect it at that early stage before they've had a clinical diagnosis. So it's, so it's an early indicator of Parkinson's as well as a, a confirmed diagnosis of Parkinson's. One of the things they need to do now is actually turn it into a more sensitive test that looks at the progression of Parkinson's. So at the moment, it's kind of a black and white on or off thing. You have Parkinson's or you don't. But what would be even more useful is if you could tell the severity of the Parkinson's. And that would be useful for drug trials to, to look at whether a drug is having an effect in terms of slowing down the progression of your Parkinson's. So that's really the next stage with developing this um, particular test. And I guess that's where the big positive of this story comes in. Not so much um, as a test to see whether or not you've got Parkinson's, because at the moment, without any treatment options or without any sort of disease modifying treatments, there's not really much you can do when you find out you have Parkinson's. But if this was, as you say, made more sensitive to the point where it could help the research into disease modifying treatments. I guess that's where the positive um, element of this comes in for people actually in the Parkinson's community. Yes, exactly. I mean, there's a number of benefits. So one is, I mean, it is useful to be able to diagnose Parkinson's more definitively because some people go through several years of not being quite sure whether they have Parkinson's or something very similar to Parkinson's. So it's certainly useful for diagnosing Parkinson's. It's actually less useful to know in the prodromal stage of Parkinson's because if, if I knew five years sooner that I was going to develop Parkinson's, I probably wouldn't want to know that. It probably wouldn't help me. It probably just make me depressed, to be honest. So that's actually not so useful. But where that does come in useful is, is in drug development, because if you can catch something earlier and, and start trying a drug earlier, then you can see a more definitive effect of that drug through the progression of the disease. So it's, it's certainly very useful for clinical trials in terms of developing better therapies for Parkinson's. What this test showed is that in the 90% of cases which are called idiopathic Parkinson's, so that's where the cause is unknown, it's kind of a general form of Parkinson's, and this was a really good predictor of, of whether you had the disease or not. But in the 10% of cases that were more genetic Parkinson's, um, it actually wasn't a very good predictor, or not such a good predictor. Um, so when you have these genetic variants, things like GBA or LARC2 as they're called, um, what that tends to imply is there might be a different mechanism underlying that. Um, so. That's really useful because it gets us closer to understanding the underlying biochemistry of what's going on in Parkinson's. There's this 90% cohort that has one type of Parkinson's, potentially this 10% genetic Parkinson's that's something slightly different. Am I right in saying then that because this test is, is uh, very accurate for one form of Parkinson's and not so accurate for another form of Parkinson's, it just it almost means that there is more of a distinction between these two 
types of Parkinson's than we thought there was before? That's right. Well, it, it's, it's not really been, I mean, a lot of people thought the genetic forms of Parkinson's were different, but I think this adds more evidence to that hypothesis that these are something slightly different, a slightly different mechanism going on in the brain than the 90% case, which is idiopathic. Um, so more research to happen, but it certainly helps us understand a little bit more about what's going on in the detail. Now, Jody, I understand that the Michael J. Fox Foundation was very closely associated with the group who actually published this data. I know that the Michael J. Fox Foundation has done some fantastic stuff for Parkinson's research in the past, and for Parkinson's in general. Um, however, I think it sounds like a really positive Thing that they are involved because they they share a lot of their information they share a lot of their their data do you see this as being you know a, a, a wider positive for parkinson's research globally absolutely yeah so where michael j fox are great is firstly because they, they put an enormous amount of money into funding academic research and scientific research more broadly but secondly they have this idea of, of making everything open access so they share the data in particular, they've collected data from thousands of patients through a couple of initiatives, one's called PPMI, and one's called Fox Insight. PPMI is a clinical study where they sort of do lots of tests on patients. And that's where this data has directly come from. And the other one, Fox Insight, is where people do sort of questionnaires and they, they submit their data to, to a database. But anyway, so Michael J. Fox matched these two large data sets, and those have been really useful in, in moving forward research into the topic. Um, and also the results of this research are fully available as well. So if you go on to the Michael J. Fox website, it will send you a link to, to the actual scientific paper, if you're, if you're that way inclined. This is published in the Lancet, and this is free access as well. Normally you'd have to pay for something like this. Um, so by making everything very open, that really helps to accelerate research. Brilliant. Maybe we could put a link to that in the, uh, in the description of this video. We'll put it just next to the subscribe button, just in case anyone wanted to uh, to watch more videos. Jody, I have heard in other areas of medical research that breakthroughs like this can often lead to other breakthroughs, not just because they're providing more information for people to work with, but actually because they sort of inspire people or drug companies really to invest in that particular area of research. Is that something you see this causing? Do you know, do you think there's going to be more money available for Parkinson's research now that this this kind of breakthroughs happened? Yeah, I think so. Definitely. There's a couple of um, obvious benefits. So one is um, now that we sort of understand Parkinson's slightly better and we can see more of a target of this, this role that alpha synuclein plays, um, that drug companies are more inclined to invest in therapies associated with that, that sort of line of, of research. And not to say that we'll have a cure tomorrow, but I think it certainly accelerates the, the, the progress that we're going to make. Um, the other thing that's interesting is um, again, it, it proves this or demonstrates the importance of this misfolded protein alpha-synuclein that forms clumps called Lewy bodies, which has long been suspected of Parkinson's. And what's really interesting is there's a, a sort of broadly similar mechanism in Alzheimer's as well. There's something called tau protein and beta amyloid proteins that form these abnormal clumps in the brain. And so there's quite likely broadly similar mechanism that's going on with Parkinson's and going on with Alzheimer's. So there could well be a side effect of, of now that we've established a, a more of a central role for the, this protein in, in Parkinson's that actually has some side benefit with Alzheimer's research, which would be absolutely fantastic. So it sounds like in summary, and stop me if this is not correct, that although this biomarker is not itself a cure, it is a very positive step in the right direction and it may in the next couple of years become a test which can really establish in a very accurate way whether or not someone has Parkinson's very early on in that process. Is that right? I think that's exactly right. So it doesn't in, in itself give us a better therapy or, or, or the big word cure. I mean cure is a long way down the line but it takes us a step in the right direction. It helps us understand the disease better and it helps accelerate clinical trials by being able to measure the disease a bit better. And, and hopefully points us in the right direction in terms of actually ultimately finding better therapies. Thank you ever so much for your explanations. I really appreciate it. If if people watching would like to find out any more about this particular subject, Jody, where can people find some more information? The best place to go is actually the Michael J. Fox website. They have a, a really good kind of two-page lay summary of what this is all about. And then, as I, as I showed earlier, there's a link to the, the scientific paper where you can read more detail if you're that way inclined. If you're interested in finding out more information about this topic or many others associated with parking then remember to subscribe because we produce a new video every week so if you want to watch more of him or is it that way then make sure you're subscribed to the channel